Welcome to What You Need to Know About Xylazine, a discussion with the American College of Medical Toxicology. My name is Merlene Tucker, and I'll be running today's web forum along with my colleague, Jeff Bornstein. Today's web forum is sponsored by the National Overdose Prevention Network, a program of PHI Center for Health, Leadership and Impact, and produced by Dialogue for Health. Meet the moderator of today's event, Dr. Mary Maddox Gonzalez. Dr. Gonzalez is a coach and preparedness consultant for the California Overdose Prevention Network, a program of PHI Center for Health Leadership and Impact. She served as the Sonoma County Public Health Officer and Division Director and the Chief Medical Officer of the Redwood Community Health Coalition for Sonoma, Napa, Yolo, and Marin Counties. She has been a board member and chair of the Latino Coalition for a Healthy California. Welcome, Mary. Thank you very much, Berlin, and welcome to all of you joining us today to learn more about xylazine. We are so fortunate to have our wonderful speakers today, and I'll be introducing them in just a minute. Could I have the next slide, please? So we'll be starting off with uh, some poll questions. We'd love to know who's on the, the, the call today, who's on our, pro, pro, is joining us for our program. And also um, you'll have the discussion with our presenters. And very importantly, as Merlene said, we really want you to put your questions in the Q&A. Uh, you may have questions about xylazine that you've already formulated, or as our speakers present, uh, more questions may come up. So please do put them in the Q&A. We're a large group today, uh, 1,500 people signed up for this uh, uh, presentation. Uh, fewer will be joining us, but still hundreds will be joining us, so we will try to get through as many questions as possible. Can I have the next slide, please? We do want to mention that uh, the National Overdose Prevention Leadership Summit will be happening November 16th and 17th. Um, this is a virtual conference. It is a two-day conference. It is excellent. It just gets better every year. Um, previously, it, there was a registration fee. It will be free this year, so we really uh, in, hope that more and more people will be able to join us this year. But it's just an excellent opportunity to uh, hear from experts in this field from throughout the United States and uh, really have an opportunity to look at what's going on, what's on the horizon. It's a great event, and we, we hope you will join us for that. Next slide, please. Today, uh, our program, you'll be learning about xylazine, what the na national data trends are uh, from the important work that's been, that the American College of Medic Medical Toxicology is undertaking. You'll also learn um, how the introduction of tylazine into the drug uh, supply in our country is affecting individuals who use drugs across the US and their communities. Um, and you will be able to describe some of the prevention and harm reduction opportunities that are relevant to xylazine when working with people who use drugs in, in your community. Okay, well, it's my pleasure now to introduce our speakers. Dr. Paul Wax is the Executive Director of the American College of Medical Toxicology. He's board certified both in medical toxicology and emergency medicine. Um, in addition to being the executive director of the American, sorry, the American College of Medical uh, Toxicology, he's also an adjunct professor in emergency medicine, focusing on medical toxicology at the Utah Southwestern School of Medicine. And he's been on the faculty there since 2006. Dr. Wax was the first executive director uh, of the American College of Medical uh, of medical toxicology back in 2008. He's been directed over $10 million of, of federally fund, funded programs in that position, including NIH, uh, FDA, CDC, and SAMHSA. Um, he's the co-principal investigator of the ACMT's Toxicology Investigators Consortium, known as TOXIC for short. And this is a really fascinating organization, 35 site multi-center research program. He's authored more than 100 peer-reviewed publications and was honored as the American College of Medical Toxicology with their Career Achievement Award. Our next speaker was going to be Dr. Kim Aldi. Uh, Dr. Kim Aldi initially joined the Toxicology Inve Investigators Consortium um, as their first toxic intern. <laughs> 
it, it's an interesting acronym. Uh, she there led a vaping initiative around the country. She currently works, is responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the toxic program, uh, helping with research publications, projects, and very importantly, uh, assuring there is support for those efforts. She earned her medical degree from the University of North Texas Health Science Center in Fort Worth. She's board certified in both medical toxicology and emergency medicine, and is an assistant professor in the departments of emergency medicine and medical toxicology at Baylor University. Dr. Rachel Colbreth joined Toxicology Investigators course, the Toxicology Investigators Consortium uh, in 2022. She received her PhD and MPH in Epidemiology and Biostatistics from Georgia State University. Very interestingly, she's done research on substance use disorder, both in the US and internationally. And she's currently uh, works as the research director for Toxic, leading new grants research project and doing that important data analysis for papers and presentations. So these we have three excellent speakers, and they are going to start off with a presentation, a brief presentation. Then we'll be go into the questions. And uh, Rachel, I believe you're going to start uh, start off the program. Yes, thank you so much, Mary, um, for the introductions, and we're so excited that all of you are here. So um, I'm just going to be starting with a few a few slides uh, that cover an overview of the data and what some of our data is showing related to xylazine. The next slide, please. So just some quick disclosures. Um, we're supported by grants from NIDA, um, CDC, as well as FDA uh, and SAMHSA. Um, and the opinions and information in this presentation are our own. Um, so medical toxicology is a field of medicine dedicated to evaluation and treatment of poison patients, including all types of drug overdose. Um, medical toxicologists are their physicians who provide consultation in emergency departments, intensive care units, other inpatient units, outpatient clinics, and poison control centers. So a variety of settings. Um, and TOXIC is the research consortium based in ACMT, as Mary mentioned, with several ongoing studies examining drug overdose. So that's what we'll really be focusing on when we talk about xylosine in the next couple of slides. So one of our first studies um, that we'll be talking about today is the Fentalog study. And in this study, we have 10 medical centers that we're collecting data from. Um, and we basically um, collect uh, data from um, opioid overdoses or suspected opioid overdose patients who present to emergency departments at our medical centers. Um, and then basically, um, we conduct a chart review to collect clinical data, such as um, demographics, any kind of treatment they may have received in the emergency department, or at, if they were admitted during their stay in the hospital, um, and all of those kinds of treatment questions. We also collect some um, data on length of stay, um, and then we also collect waste serum, which is waste blood, um, from the patients. Uh, through a waiver of consent, and we analyze um, the blood for toxicology tests. So basically, we're looking for um, analytes and drugs of abuse, novel psychoactive substances, and we currently partner um, with uh, one of the, the largest labs in the state-of-the-art equipment um, for detecting these novel psychoactive substances for the Center for Forensic Science Research and Education, um, CFSRE for short, and um, they conduct, their library has over 1,100 analytes or drugs that they test for in the metabolites as well. So basically, um, there's a lot of different drugs that, that we test for. And so we have a broad um, capability of testing outside of sort of the basic hospital panel or some of the, um, it, you know, especially like the standard panels. Uh, so you can see some of our data on the left as well as the right. So the left side, we just present some of the, the relative frequency of xylazine. So among um, the cases of confirmed patient opioid overdoses, which do primarily make up about 90% of our cases. So as I mentioned, we have recruitment um, inclusion criteria for this study based on suspected opioid overdose. Um, and it's true that in 90% of those samples, they do have some sort of opioid. Um, and the other 10% you know, may consist of something like benzodiazepines or cannabinoids or something of that sort. Um, so among those with confirmed opioid exposures, the, the total relative frequency of xylazine is 17%, and that's across all of our sites. 
Um, so you can see some of the highest uh, the highest prevalence of xylazine right now is is still focused in the in the northeast with Pittsburgh having the highest um, proportion or prevalence of xylazine among our study, and then followed by Mount Sinai. Um, and we do have a lot of xylazine that is being detected in the Midwest, um, as well as starting to seep across the the states to the west. Um, interestingly, we have no samples from Denver that tested positive for xylazine to date, um, but we're continuing to kind of keep keep an eye on that. Um, and then you can see over to the right side, we just have our, um, it basically a, CDC has several dashboards for non-fatal overdoses. And because we're collecting information and enrolling patients who present to emergency departments, um, it's primarily our sample is consistent of non-fatal opioid overdoses. Um, and so that um, the morbidity team at CDC has a few um, data dashboards that they present on their website and they're activated or um, sorry, they're updated pretty frequently with the data that we are getting coming in because we're actively collecting data um, for this study. And so this the um, the dashboard is called the Fentalog dashboard, and basically you can go in and see, and we do have a um, data point on xylazine. So the fentanyl and xylazine samples make up about 20%, um, and that's of all of the, the samples. Mm -hmm. And I do just want to, oh, go ahead. Kim. Thank you, Rachel, for introducing that. I just wanted to, again, bring your attention to this left um, left-sided graph. I mean, it's just so interesting. You know, we have uh, sites around the country um, in, both in this study and the next study that that you're going to present, uh, Rachel. But um, you know, it, it's not necessarily all northeast. You know, we're starting to see it flow um, to the west. And when we first started this project in 2020, and we started seeing xylazine roll in, you know, at that time we were not uh, really that well versed in what xylazine was. Um, but as this project has progressed, we can see that um, xylazine is also um, becoming more prevalent. Um, not only in the Northeast, but in other areas of the country over time, which is just a really uh, interesting uh, thing for us to see uh, in this project. Yes, thank you, Kim. And that's a great point too. I mean, in terms of um, not only geographical diversity of, of what we're seeing with xylazine, but also the co-occurrence with other substances. So a lot of times xylazine is found amongst um, a host of other substances. So it's not just fentanyl and xylazine that we're finding in the blood. It's a number of um, adulterants, which may be you know, mixed in with some of the drugs uh, that people are pur purchasing, or it could be um, some of the novel psychoactive benzodiazepines. We're finding um, a high proportion of those in the xylazine samples. And so I think the, the also the take home point is that there are, it's not just fentanyl and xylazine most of the time. Um, and you can go next slide, please. So we did publish um, some of the, the earlier reports of xylazine um, in a journal called Clinical Toxicology. Um, and basically what we found is we compared, well, we compared uh, patients with xylazine to patients who um, didn't test positive for xylazine. And we basically looked at outcomes such as receiving CPR, coma, um, and we basically found that among those who had both fentanyl and xylazine, they were less likely to, to receive CPR and less likely to need admission to the intensive care unit um, compared to those who um, who did not receive xylaz or did, who did not test positive for xylazine. And some of the hypotheses um, around this, you know, are still we're still evolving. So, well, one, um, you know, a lot of the data data here is pretty early, and so we're planning on replicating some of these analyses, but um, some of our interim analyses have also shown true that um, there are lower rates of coma um, and CPR among those who test positive for xylazine compared to those with um, without xylazine but with fentanyl. And, you know, that may be due to a dilutional effect, you know, that the fentanyl um, in the drug is actually a higher potency or that um, those the samples of fentanyl with xylazine uh, may actually be diluting the amount of fentanyl in it because of the xylazine. So, um, there's a lot of different hypotheses that we're we're looking at right now, um, but the the bottom line is that more studies are needed, you know, to determine these clinical effects of xylazine, um, particularly long-term effects of chronic xylazine use, um, and the best treatment for xylazine and fentanyl overdoses as well as withdrawal. I don't know if Kim and Paul want to add anything to this study. 
I know that was about it. I know we're going to um, probably come to a question soon where we uh, go over this in more detail. So I'll, I'll leave it to that. Yeah. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so this is um, one of our newest projects, and we're really excited about um, the Drug Overdose Toxico Surveillance Reporting Program, which is called DOTS for short. Um, we started data collection in early 2023, so April 2023. Um, but the, the project started and started just last year. So relatively new project. We're actually um, covering 17 medical sites with this study. And this study has three data collection components. Um, one is a chart review, which is very similar to Fentalog. And um, we also have a structured patient interview. And then we are doing blood toxicology tests. But in addition to the qualitative test, which we just presented on with the Fentalog study. So basically testing for the presence of the drug, yes or no. Um, this, the DOTS reporting program actually has the quantitative toxicology test. And for those, we can actually determine the relative um, concentration of drug um, in the serum or in the blood. Um, so that is sort of a strength um, that, you know, we're going forward and being able to kind of understand xylazine is also like the relative contribution of xylazine in a quantitative format um, compared to just what is the presence of xylazine, yes or no. And from there, we really hope to be able to gain um, a more comprehensive picture of the, of the patient's overdose and the clinical presentation in the context of those quantitative measurements um, or quantitative values. So, so just some very, very quick preliminary um, data points, patients with opioid or stimulant overdose. Oh, and I did forget to mention this. Um, in addition to opioid overdoses, we're also enrolling patients with stimulant overdoses. So if they, if they present with either opioid or stimulant um, overdose symptoms then or signs, then um, they're eligible as well as if they're over 13 years of age or older, um, and then have the ability to provide um, blood sample. So 17% of all of our samples combined across geographical regions um, with fentanyl have xylazine. Um, in this study, we did not find any um, xylazine without fentanyl. So all of our xylazine samples also had fentanyl in them, um, which is a little bit different than the fentalog study, which we have a very, very small proportion of xylazine samples that were found without fentanyl. Um, and I just wanted to point out that so far we've detected xylazine in St. Louis, Pittsburgh, and Portland, but we're in the very, very, very early stages of, of, this, um, of this study. So I just wanted to, to kind of give a, a short snapshot um, and there's more to come because a lot of different data points that we're collecting in this reporting program um, can help to answer some of the questions around xylazine treatment, um, in particular, in the patient interview, um, for those who, you know, self, you know, what they reported taking is that, you know, concurrent or consistent with what's actually found in the blood. You know, that's one of the the other main aims that we're we're hoping to look at. So, and something interesting about this, you know, we just started this study. We have currently over three hundred patients. Um, and uh, over, you know, 250 or more interviews uh, from these patients where we asked them, you know, what is the drug that you used before you um, overdose or before you came to the hospital? And, um, and some of the things that we're seeing are stimulants, you know, they, before an opioid-like overdose, a, you know, suspected opioid overdose that brought them to the hospital, they are saying, you know, I was just using cocaine or uh, methamphetamine um, and, I, you know, some of them report that they've never used uh, an opioid um, illicitly. And so it's uh, it's just a very interesting, uh, you know, amount of um, data that we're receiving from this. Uh, and with the analytes, we're able to see, you know, what is it likely that they were exposed to? Um, and it, it may or may not be what they thought, um, which is another thing we're seeing. Um, the other thing I know you didn't you didn't mention here, but there are you know there are many other adulterants uh, in addition to xylazine. Um, some of these patients come in with over you know 15, uh, 20 um, analytes in their blood, um, including um, illicit benzodiazepines um, of many different varieties. Um, so there's a lot of things that could be um, causing their symptoms that are bringing them in, but also 
um, causing their um, outcomes that um, that are either prolonged length of stay or intubations. Yes, thank you, Kim. And next slide, I think that might be all the slides. Yes, we have. So um, we just kind of wanted to have those slides to show an overview of the data, but we're excited about talking with you all more. Thank you so much, Rachel. Really appreciate that presentation and, and Kim, your comments also. Um, at this point, we're going to move into some questions. And again, we we know some folks are putting uh, their uh, questions into the Q&A. Please continue to do that. Also, I saw some reactions. We encourage reactions. It's one way to interact in these virtual environments. Um, so I'm going to start with the first question, which is pretty broad. You know, can you describe uh, xylazine? What is our current understanding of the drug? And what are the big questions uh, that you have that we still don't know about uh, as to what we don't know about the drug yes, yet? Yeah, uh, so, so uh, I can start unless... Um, perfect. Oh, you can jump in. Uh, so, oh. <laughs> sorry, okay. So uh, basically, you know, xylene, xylazine is a, a potent central alpha-2 um, adrenergic, uh, sorry, agonist. Um, and uh, it's similar, I, whenever I think of xylazine, I think of clonidine, which is a, a drug that's a prescription drug, um, you know, in humans, but xylazine, the difference is, is that it has been used in veterinary medicine um, for a very long time, um, and it's used for sedation, uh, like a one-time use. So when we see this drug used in animals, it's usually to sedate them one time. And what we're seeing now that it's you know, mixed into uh, fentanyl, but also can be found with other um, illicit drugs um, is that, you know, we're seeing other effects from it, chronic effects like wounds that we uh, don't really have reported in, in animals. Um, um, you know, a lot, of, uh, a, lot, a lot of what we know about xylazine um, is from animal studies. There's really uh, not a whole lot known uh, from, from what happens to humans in large doses, or um, you know, there's a, a few case reports like from the 80s um, where veterinarians may have um, injected themselves with it um, and had poor outcomes, but um, overall, there's not much known. The other thing is because it's mixed, uh, we're seeing it mixed into um, the illicit drug supply, you know, a lot of times it's in addition to something. So because of that, it clouds what we know about this drug um, and what we know that this drug can do, because what we're seeing is, you know, a, a stimulant and xylazine or an opioid and xylazine. And so those symptoms um, just from xylazine can sometimes be um, unclear. Um, so currently, you know, there is some research being done on it. Um, there was a recent animal study that came out looking at um, receptors and, and effects, but um, because it, it was never made for humans, um, we have a very low amount of data on what it does in humans. Very interesting. Really, poly substance use is the, has become the norm. So it, I, I can see how challenging it would be to really determine what one single drug in that kind of cocktail of drugs, uh, the impact is. Thank you so much. Um, you know, in, in terms of what our understanding that, that, that difficulty with what I just said with polysubstitutes, but what are the common signs and symptoms of xylosine toxicity? And how much does the severity vary in those symptoms? Um, well, I can interject. Uh, you know, just to keep a couple of things in perspective, um, you know, the opioid drug epidemic has changed dramatically over the last few years. <laughs> I mean, in, in my 30 plus year career in medical toxicology, I've not seen as much of a change in anything as we've seen the opioid epidemic, which, you know, has been around for decades. People have abused opioids for, for many, many decades, but it was certainly fueled in the early 2000s by the prescription opioid epidemic. Um, and then that kind of morphed into more of a heroin uh, resurgence um, as there were restrictions on um, obtaining prescription opioids. And then that morphed into, uh, um, you know, a, a problem with uh, fentanyl um, as the primary opioid. <laughs> and then more recently, you know, both opioids and stimulants together. Uh, but it's it's changed dramatically. And what we're seeing and, and the way we refer to these 
exposures or, you know, as you mentioned, poly drug exposures, because literally every every one of these exposures has more than one drug. Uh, the, the number of exposures that we see that only have one drug are uh, few and far between. You know, heroin has, has almost dried up completely. As we, you know, started our Fentalox study in 2020, we were still seeing, you know, some heroin, but that's almost gone to zero <laughs> in recent months. Uh, and and these cases, uh, you know, not only have one uh, class of substance like uh, opioid, but, uh, you know, have both opioids and stimulants. And at least 50% of our cases have both drugs. You know, whether the intended um, user was seeking out both drugs is, you know, to be determined and is debatable. And that's why we're doing uh, uh we're, we're we're doing interviews with these patients to try to understand what, what they were actually seeking out. And then we have the confirmation by this laboratory uh, in terms of what they actually took. And another thing to keep in mind is that most hospital laboratories, uh, the clinical laboratories within a hospital, has very limited capability. In, in fact, up until recently, many of these hospital laboratories could not even detect fentanyl. They, 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 could, they could detect an opioid, but the, the parent compound that was uh, the analyte that they were detecting was morphine. Heroin is metabolized to morphine. So if someone used heroin, it would pop positive as uh, opioid positive. But fentanyl is not metabolized to morphine. And so it wasn't even detecting fentanyl. Now, um, more and more of the clinical hospitals, uh, clinical labs and hospitals are detecting fentanyl. And in some states like California, there have been regulations uh, trying to mandate that fentanyl testing be available in the hospital. Uh, but that's, you know, based on jurisdiction, maybe in California at the present time, not in other states. And, and so the data that's generated through uh, hospital laboratories is, is very limited. Um, and uh, that, that's why only through a you know, specialized research laboratory like the one we're dealing with, uh, are we able to see the full gauntlet of, of, of substances that people take. So, you know, these, these cases have both stimulants and opioids and other substances. You know, some of them are other drugs like benzodiazepines. Um, you know, some of them are pharmaceutical benzodiazepines. Some of them are actually illicit benzodiazepines, which are not meant for human use or were, were never approved. Uh, and then you have a lot of other substances often labeled as adulterants. I mean, there's other, other uh, terms sometimes used to describe these other substances. You know, some of them that have been used for decades, like quinine or, you know, phenobutazone, which is a horse tranquilizer, um, which has its own toxicity, or levamisole, which was seen in a lot of cocaine cases starting in the late 2000s, um, and then more recently, xylazine. So, you know, xylazine, why is xylazine there? Un unclear. Yeah, I mean, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of hypotheses about why xylazine is there. You know, some have thought that it may potentiate the effect of the opioid, or or lead to you know a slightly different experience. One one of the one of the problems, one of the real changes in in opioid consumption has been, given the fact that fentanyl has such a short half life, is that people consume fentanyl many times a day. Um, you know, the typical heroin user would use, you know, three, four, five times a day, maybe. Um, one of the problems with the crack epi epidemic, for those who remember that back in the 80s and 90s, is you know people were using you know crack cocaine over and over and over again. Um, again, a, a drug that has a short half life. Well, the same thing's happening with fentanyl. I mean, people are not using fentanyl three or four times a day; they're using fentanyl eight or ten or twelve times a day. I mean, the the amount and the, the amount of fentanyl they're consuming is astronomical. Fentanyl is extraordinarily potent, much more potent than heroin or morphine, and it's used therapeutically. I mean, just like morphine, it remains kind of the standard uh, analgesic for severe pain. Uh, uh, fentanyl is, is, is equally uh, effective, if, if not more so. It, it, to some degree, it has fewer side effects than morphine when used therapeutically. But fentanyl is dosed in microgram amounts, 50 micrograms you know, which is one twentieth of a milligram. I mean, it's a it's a very small dose that's used uh, for uh, 
um, therapeutically, 50 to 100 micrograms. Well, patients that are chronically abusing fentanyl are using many milligram amounts of fentanyl over the course of the day. So they're using a, a really an astronomical a large amount of, of an opioid. Um, they d develop a very severe dependence on, on, on fentanyl, like you can develop a dependence on, on any opioid. Um, and, um, uh, and then there's the, and then there's the xylazine, which may be there to prolong the effect, or may be there to dilute the amount of fentanyl because the, uh, amount of fentanyl that's, uh, psychoactive is, is a very small amount. And, and so, you know, drug dealers, you know, want to maximize their profits, uh, um, and so they will often uh, dilute the drug with something else, you know, which could be something as uh, inert as sucrose or uh, sugar, um, or it could be an, another drug like uh, quinine, for instance, um, or 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 you know some other sort of substance. Like in this case, it's a veterinary uh, drug which is not meant for human consumption, which is which is xylazine. Um, so, you know, Paul, what, what does that look like clinically, though, when you're Talking about all these this poly drug use, uh, so, what does it look like for the clinical with somebody with xylazine? Yeah, right. well, um, <laughs> I, I think um, you know it, it depends on the scenario of whether you're dealing with a drug overdose or you're dealing with someone who's you know chronically using the drug but not necessarily overdosing, and and they, and these are two different scenarios. So you know, just with, in general, with the with the drug overdose. Mm -hmm. you know, presented in one of the slides, some of the data on the drug overdose. With the with the drug overdose, yeah, they're overdosing on the on the fentanyl. They're not overdosing on the on the xylazine, and and they're and they're presenting like a fentanyl overdose, which with has you know decreased respirations, you know, coma, CNS depression. Um, but as as the data that Rachel showed before, uh, the overdose with fentanyl plus xylazine is not necessarily any worse. Than a, just a fentanyl overdose, and it, it may actually—not that it's safe—but it, it may, you know, there, there, it may not be quite as severe, you know, when you're when you're comparing the fentanyl plus xylazine group to the fentanyl group. I mean, they, you can die from both of them, <laughs> but you right. know, it may not be quite as severe. That's with the acute overdose. But in, in the chronic users, you know, what's popped up with the xylazine uh, are these very uh, nasty wounds, you know. Um, and that's and that's gotten a lot of folks' attention because uh, these wounds can be very uh, disfiguring, uh, necrotic, very difficult to treat. Uh, now, it's not that people that inject drugs don't develop wounds, and this is one of the, you know, one of the earlier issues. Well, you know, the typical patient that injects drugs is at risk for all sorts of infectious complications because often the needle is dirty, it's contaminated with bacteria, and they come in with abscesses, they come in with deep wounds, uh, just without any xylazine. But, but when they use uh, fentanyl with xylazine, even if they don't inject, even if they smoke it, <laughs> they're not even injecting it, you know, there's a risk for these wounds. And, and sometimes they develop these wounds not where they inject, but uh, at a distance from the uh, 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 where they inject. And, and our un understanding of these wounds uh, is still relatively limited, but it's certainly drawn a lot of attention. A lot to, lot to learn about this. You know, it, with all the information that you've, uh, pre that you've presented in the slides and you're talking about the limited access to uh, laboratory testing locally in hospitals and all the introduction, how it's kind of um, spreading throughout the U.S. Um, interested in knowing what are the implications for communities? Maybe Rachel, you can give us your perspective on this. You know, and, and what is how what how is this impacting communities in terms of harm reduction needs? In terms of um, how we can support uh, individuals using drugs who are using uh, uh, drugs that are do in, include um, salazine. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and, you know, with talking with uh, some harm reduction um, providers in some of the other projects that we work with, you know, a lot of people are passing out sort of wound kits, you know, regardless if they have a wound or not, because if they, as they, as we are detecting xylazine, you know, in patients' blood um, in certain areas, you know, anecdotally, providers um, on the front lines are seeing it as well. So some of the harm reduction providers who are handing out for, say, a, you know, a naloxone kit may also hand out a wound care kit and some resources to go. And I think one of the biggest barriers um, that 
you know, I think is a, a community um, or needs to be a community approach to this is, is how to kind of address these wounds as a barrier to inpatient care. Um, so inpatient detox, inpatient care, I think all of that is really important um, in terms of, of you know, addressing all of that. Um, and then uh, another thing for, for harm reduction approaches is, you know, just making sure that, um, and I'll, I'll let Kim and um, Paul, you know, comment more on this, but in terms of naloxone, I mean, because the fentanyl is so potent in the drug supply that naloxone is still going, you know, one of our best, um, you know, tools in our toolbox to, to fight um, the opioid epidemic. And so, um, and because xylazine is so often found with fentanyl that, you know, naloxone is still um, one of the best products to use. So um, I know there's some, there were some conversations in the chat about naloxone responding or uh, xylazine responding to naloxone, but I did see that in the chat. Yeah. So that, that, to clarify, yeah, if you could clarify that about, you know, naloxone, what it's responding to, and do you have to do anything different when there is xylazine on board? It, yeah. So the data um, so far uh, doesn't uh, convince one that one has to do anything different other than you know, use the dose of naloxone required to reverse the you know opioid overdose. Uh, now, it's interesting because, as, as Kim alluded to before, structurally, pharmacologically, xylazine is similar to clonidine. And clonidine, uh, which is not an opioid, but it, it does interface with some of the same brain uh, areas uh, that uh, opioids uh, interface with. And because of that, a a after a clonidine overdose, uh, for years now, people have used naloxone to try to reverse the sedative effects of clonidine uh, with, with mixed su success. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, so there may be a role you know, potentially for naloxone to reverse the xylazine. But in these patients with uh, xylazine plus, um, uh, with fentanyl plus xylazine, um, you know, the, the most active of the two compounds, you know, clearly is the, is the fentanyl. Now, the amount of the xylazine in these, uh, um, in the blood or in the drug specimen uh, does vary considerably. And one of the things we're doing in our latest study, the STOT study, is we're actually quantitating how much xylazine is in the blood versus how much uh, uh, fentanyl is in the blood to give us a, a little bit of a better uh, uh, view of, of, you know, is the xylazine actually contributing to, you know, the toxicity and, and the overdose. So that that's still to be, um, you know, further in, investigated. Um, in, in some of these cases, there seems to be a fair amount of xylazine, but, you know, how much does the xylazine actually contribute to the overdose itself remains somewhat unclear. Uh, you know, I, I should also mention, you know, other harm reduction challenges you know, with this, you know, emerging xylazine threat. And, and, and some of that is related to the use of buprenorphine, which has really transformed, um, you know, the way we approach patients with opioid use disorder in a, in a very positive light in terms of, you know, we, we now have something to be able to treat them with, you know, starting off when they first present uh, uh, after an overdose. Uh, but um, it was, one uh, approach when uh, it was mainly heroin, where there was a standard uh, buprenorphine dosing strategy to induce patients and get them onto uh, a maintenance dose on buprenorphine. With, with fentanyl, it's been much more challenging. The same dose of buprenorphine doesn't necessarily have the desirable effect. Um, there are many who have been using different dosing strategies with buprenorphine, either uh, low dose uh, buprenorphine or high dose buprenorphine, because of the problem with uh, with withdrawal, because uh, buprenorphine is a mixed uh, agonist antagonist, and so you know if you precipitate withdrawal <laughs> even once, while it's not life threatening, it it may deter the patient from agreeing to you know have buprenorphine in the future, which which is very concerning because buprenorphine can be definitely life threatening. Now, uh, uh, life saving. Now, on top of that, with the xylazine, and 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 having, you know, uh, mixed responses to buprenorphine in someone who's using uh, um, fentanyl and xylazine, that can be also potentially more problematic. So there's a lot of research that needs to be done here, uh, because you know, with some of these patients that are using fentanyl and xylazine, 
uh, they may be less interested in, in going into, into into treatment just because of their concerns about the adverse effects of, of the withdrawal. Yeah, there's also some, uh, you know, case reports that xylazine can cause withdrawal in itself. So you have these patients that, you know, will um, be using fentanyl and xylazine will, you know, want to get into uh, SUD treatment um, and they will start, uh, you know, on a regimen, but they will still uh, have withdrawal symptoms um, and it may be secondary to xylazine. There's very few case reports, but it's still pretty concerning. We know clonidine definitely has withdrawal symptoms um, after cessation. So it would not be uncommon to think that, or, you know, it wouldn't be out of the realm to think that um, that xylazine does as well. What, what sort of uh, symptoms occur with a, a xylazine uh, withdrawal? Well, that can you know, be distinguished from yeah. other, uh, with this poly drug use that can be distinguished from other. Great question. Uh, it's about the opposite of what an overdose just straight xylazine would be. So you usually get CNS depression. You can have bradycardia and hypotension or hypertension um, with uh, xylazine and with clonidine. Um, when you're withdrawing, these patients feel very anxious. They may be diaphoretic. They may feel uh, like their heart rate is is higher than it was before, um, and they can have, um, you know, hypertension. So these these patients may just feel very unwell, you know, like you would, uh, like you're having the flu, uh, just like somebody, you know, does when they um, are withdrawing um, from opioids as well. You know, they may have nausea, vomiting, um, diarrhea, uh, sweatiness, uh, clamminess. Um, all of these things. So that really impacts it. And, you know, we we're just talking about, um, you know, drugs and how uh, how a lot of these um, patients like multi, uh, they have multi drugs in their system. Um, you know, some, some of them think they're using stimulants, you know, so for them, you know, if you ask them, you know, you want to, do you want to get on buprenorphine or methadone? And they don't realize that they are getting amounts of fentanyl every day. Um, you know, they don't think they need it, you know, or nobody offers it to them because they don't elicit uh, that they are actually, um, you know, they don't know that they're already uh, using opioids um, that can really cloud the picture. So it's multiple things that can cause it, these withdrawal symptoms that people may re be reluctant um, to get into treatment. Thank you. Um, we're gonna go to, to some of the questions from um, our, the, our audience, but I wanted to say, you know, if they given all of this, what actionable steps do you think that members of our audience can take in terms of best responding in their communities, wherever they are on that map, literally the map of the US and where it is, where it may be well established, where it may be coming, are there any recommendations for what communities should be doing? It's really difficult, you know, providing as much resource as you can, um, engaging uh, patients, you know, there's a very big stigma in this patient population and they do not wanna seek medical care. They don't wanna seek help. Um, because they're afraid of being judged, um, which they have been, you know, probably throughout their lives. So these are all things that, you know, providing a safe environment for them to uh, come to and get uh, get help is really um, the best thing I can say. Um, you know, it's, it's just a really challenging uh, population as well. So um, having an open door and, and uh, having many different programs and ways for them to reach out um, would be the best thing. I, I think the um, the major confounding issues with xylazine, you know, is exactly what Kim just mentioned is 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 the increasing stigmatization of patients that use drugs that include xylazine because of these wounds. They may be less uh, interested in getting uh, you know treatment just because of being ostracized. Uh, and um, it may be more difficult to keep them in treatment, um, you know, because of you know their concerns about the wounds. So I think that's that's part of it for those who have the wounds. And then also, as we mentioned with the buprenorphine, some more challenges with you know potentially precipitated withdrawal and having a bad experience trying to be induced on buprenorphine and kind of giving up and not wanting um, that that sort of you know treatment. Uh, and so they continue to use the drugs at you know high risk for you know, death and, and, and more serious morbidity. So I, th I think those are, you know, some of the confounding issues that xylosine has brought to the table. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I want to ask some of these questions. We're trying to get through as many as possible. Uh, do you have data on the impact of, of uh, 
xylazine on uh, Native American populations and community communities? Please? Yeah, uh, we don't. Um... Our, our numbers are still small, um, so we don't have uh, much data specifically on Native Americans, but, you know, that's uh, an area of, of interest for sure, and whoever, um, you know, put in that question, you know, feel free to reach out to us because, you know, we, we'd love to, you know, continue to expand some of the work that we've done. I, I think there was a, a prior question in the, in the Q&A about, you know, can other sites, you know, potentially join um, our, our program, you know, we're funded through the FDA for a, a certain number of, of sites, but, you know, given the fact that we've set up some, uh, you know, some good infrastructure for what we're currently doing, you know, if we could, you know, partner with others that might be interested in, in this sort of work and try to identify other, you know, funding sources to expand the program, you know, we'd certainly be very much interested in, in exploring those uh, uh, options. Perfect. I'm glad you're, you're looking at these questions, too. That's great. Um, and uh, let's see what else uh, you talked about. You responded to a lot of these questions uh, about the um, what is, you know, some of the impacts of this. Um, is there anything that can be done to reduce the, 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 the wounds? Is there any uh, our preventive measures? I, I mean, but I would assume clean syringes helps with it reducing any kind of infection. Um, but in, in general, there's, it seems like there's a lack of clarity about the kind of pathophysiology, what's really causing these wounds. It um, makes it challenging, but anything that has been successful in, um, in the communities to, to reduce this? These wounds are interesting because xylazine actually has a very similar structure um, to levamisole. And we know that levamisole um, that's been mixed in cocaine for decades now, um, you know, causes these, uh, you know, your fingers and your nose and your, your ears to uh, have some a necrotic appearance. So they, they turn black and look necrotic, but cessation of cocaine would, would reverse that in many cases. Um, but with these patients, um, you know, cessation isn't uh, necessarily going to make the wounds go away. Some of them are very deep, very, um, you know, disfiguring, but also can lead to, you know, amputations. Um, so it's not exactly the same as what we've seen with other wounds. And though we know that, you know, cocaine um, can can cause uh, the, this necrotic necrotic areas, you know, we know a lot more about what kind of um, process that is. But with xylazine, we don't. We don't really know, you know, is it a vasculitis necessarily, or is it um, from the drug itself causing breakdown of tissue. Um, it's just, it's not really as clear. So more studies need to be done because, you know, in animals, again, we, we never saw this. Um, so, you know, chronic use just hadn't been seen before. Thank you. Um, and, you know, you talked about you have relatively small numbers at this time, but demographic trends that you're seeing in terms of the use of xylazine over and overdoses, well, I, I, yeah, I mean, I think um, we're seeing, uh, you know, some more cases, you know, in the middle of the country and and in some selected areas out west. Uh, I think that's, you know, changed over time. And, you know, it's obviously of, of concern um, in some of the um, sites back east, you know, particularly in the Philadelphia area and the, and the northeast, uh, like New York, there may be a, a bit of a down um, tick in, in the amount of silencing. So we're, we're following that closely as well. Um, you know, getting back to, you know, whether people are seeking out silencing or not, uh, you know, we, we've heard from patients kind of a mixed uh, um, mixed messages. I mean, there, there may be a few that, you know, think it, there may be some, you know, advantage to the, the, the xylazine in terms of maybe prolonging the effect of the of the of the fentanyl, but others, you know, suggest that there's more of a dysphoric experience than their usual, you know, fentanyl um, experience, and, and so they would, uh, you know, they're not they're not seeking it out. Um, and as mentioned before, just responding to one other question in the, the Q and A, uh, um, you know, we, we're seeing almost no. Um, well, I don't think we've seen any case of just xylazine in the blood. Uh, there's a very few cases of xylazine with some other drug other than fentanyl, but it's, you know, we haven't seen any cases of pure xylazine. Now, if you go back in the literature back actually years ago into the 1980s, you know, there are cases of, of xylazine overdose of, of vet, mainly veterinarians and people that have access to veterinary products that, 
you have overdose on, on xylazine, and, and it has a significant CNS depressant effect because it is a, a sedative. Uh, but but currently, you know, we're not seeing you know pure xylazine overdose. Mm -hmm. And, and that reminds me, one of the questions was, is it is this a veterinary drug that is prescribed? And yes, it is, that there is a, yes. uh, a medical veterinary use for this that's, that's appropriate. Um, I know we're getting very close to the end, and I did want to ask each of you, what if you had one takeaway, looking at, at xylazine, looking at what's happening in, in the overdose landscape right now, what would it be for each of you? Kim, we would start with you. A takeaway. Um, I mean, you know, when I was younger, uh, it seemed like everything was different, but maybe it wasn't because <laughs> we weren't testing for things. But you know, you don't you don't see things until you test for it. And um, I feel like um, you know, the takeaway for me is to realize that all illicit drugs are likely poly drug exposures. All overdoses that come into the emergency department into the hospital are likely. Um, you know, multi-drug overdoses just based on the data that we're seeing and um, and even, you know, drug testing that we're seeing um, that people are, you know, they seize drugs and they test it and they can see that. So um, just realizing that, I think that's the biggest takeaway, um, being open that, you know, maybe um, naloxone is not going to be um, curative for someone with an opioid overdose because there may be other things on board like illicit benzos or xylazine. Thank you. Um, Rachel, anything you'd like to add? What you would want people to make sure that looking at this landscape? I, th I think it's actually really similar not to still Kim's takeaway, but, um, you know, looking at this data and you can see I, I copy and pasted a few um, to a few responses in the chat uh, to the to our CDC dashboard. Um, and I just wanted to to kind of point out we have a little data bite on there and it says, only 2% of these samples um, contain fentanyl and only fentanyl. So basically that shows you that there's a high, you know, prevalence of poly drugs. It's not only xylosine. There's a lot of things, you know, clouding the picture, so to speak. And I think it's really complicated to get at isolating these clinical effects from xylosine because of the poly drug exposures. Um, but I think the biggest takeaway is that, you know, being open to, you um, you know, trying to to basically like, you know, address uh, the poly drug um, epidemic is, you know, it's an uphill battle, but it's it's one that many are fighting on the front line. So. Thank you. Yeah, very important point. And Paul, anything you'd like to add? Well, um, you know, drug taking is a risky behavior um, <laughs> at baseline. Um, the fentanyl uh, explosion has um, introduced a drug that is much more potent um, than prior drugs. And that's why there are all these overdoses and all these overdose deaths. Um, you know, concerns I, I've seen, you know, recently, particularly with our data set is, you know, the number of folks that are, you know, their drug of choice is a stimulant, either cocaine or methamphetamine. And you know, with their stimulant, methamphetamine or cocaine, they're also getting fentanyl and they're overdosing on the fentanyl, even though that's not what they intended to use. We're seeing a lot of those cases, very concerning. Also extraordinarily concerning is the fact that, you know, unlike heroin, which was used almost predominantly intravenously, I mean, it would be used, you know, sometimes smoking it as well, is that fentanyl, you know, is also, uh, um, you know, put into pill form or capsule form and, and, you know, particularly with younger people, you know, they, they, they go to a party, they take a pill, they think it's maybe a, a Xanax or, or something else. And it happens to be fentanyl and the one pill of fentanyl it could, could, could kill them. I mean, extraordinarily concerning, you know, the introduction of the xylazine, um, it, it, you know, these wounds, they're nasty that people don't die of the wounds, but it, it puts up another barrier to care uh, that needs to be addressed. Uh, and you know, getting people into um, buprenorphine treatment or methadone remains the mainstay of, of our of our proactive approach. But you know, the xylazine may complicate that even more, um, as does fentanyl, just uh, people's adverse response to initiating the treatment. Uh, and so, perseverance and trying to get people into therapy is 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 really critically important. And then, lastly. You know whether it's fentanyl by itself or fentanyl and xylazine or fentanyl on any of these other drugs. You know the life-threatening 
um, the, the life-saving, you know, intervention is naloxone and, you know, getting naloxone into, um, you know, communities, families, users, you know, first responders uh, remains, you know, critically important. Thank you so much. And um, I know we're almost at time, but thank you so much for, for um, all of your comments. Thank you all of those of you who are in our audience for the thoughtful questions that you've um, put in the, in the Q&A. And uh, just in addition today, thank you for the tremendous work you're doing um, at the uh, College of Toxic American Medical College of Toxicology, and for everybody who's on this call who are doing this important work in our communities. Have you seen it's getting more complex uh, and more important every day the work you're doing? Thank you all so much for joining us. We have one other slide I wanted to show. Again, reminder of the over, uh, National Overdose Prevention Leadership Summit. And one more slide. And we wanna remind you that the National Overdose Prevention Network has a website with, with the, where you can find today's presentation, be up in about a week, and many other resources. We, we invite you to um, join NOPEN and to definitely uh, take a look at the website. There are many resources there. And thank you all so much for joining us today and for all the work that you do. Thank you.